Hey guys, what's up Mad Season here? I'm back with another video for you in my Patch by Patch series. And boy, has it been a while since I've done one of these. About seven months in fact, when we finished our coverage with the pre-release of World of Warcraft. Not really for any reason, just lots of other stuff I wanted to do I guess. But with the official re-release of Classic now out, I think it's appropriate now more than ever to cover the vanilla state of the game and how it's changed from 1.1 to 1.12 since there are a lot of misconceptions out there. So, sit back and enjoy a bit of history of World of Warcraft and the dawn of its official release. Before we get into the actual patch, I wanted to mention the state of MMOs at the time and set the scene that the game was arriving in. The MMO genre is gaining in popularity, but it's still relatively niche at the time. The reigning champion at World of Warcraft's release is EverQuest, and just to give you an idea, it had just over 500,000 subscribers at the time. At the end of vanilla World of Warcraft, Blizzard had amassed a whopping 8 million, and in its peak in Wrath of the Lich King, it was around 12 million. So at this point, the MMO genre as a whole is still in its infancy, and there's no set standard of what they should be. It wasn't long before World of Warcraft was the standard, however. As you'd know if you saw previous episodes, whereas the more popular MMOs like EverQuest or Ultima Online, they're more unforgiving and very unfriendly to the beginner. Things such as XP loss or permanent character death were common before World of Warcraft hit the scene. So, with its main draw being to appeal to this untapped market of the casual gamer, it would strike gold and revolutionize how MMOs are made. It was one of the most anticipated MMOs at the time, and magazine after magazine gave out rave reviews of the best world that the game had to offer. And slowly but surely, it became a giant, serving as a fresh start for refugees of other MMOs at the time. I mentioned in previous videos, I personally came from Star Wars Galaxies, and the reason I quit that game was not of boredom or anything. It's just that all of my friends simply stopped playing, and they jumped ship to this fresh new blockbuster called World of Warcraft. So, November 23rd, 2004. The official release of the game, patch 1.1. Appropriately, this patch holds some of the biggest features of any episode in this entire series thus far, starting with the raids. Raids were one of the many things that the game revolutionized. Just the idea of an instanced endgame was pretty new. Before this, many of the endgame bosses would be out in the world just like any other mob. The madness that was the world boss race in Classic was the norm in other games. Griefing, social engineering, drama. It was extremely competitive, and the best guilds could lock down the server. In Star Wars Galaxies, there was the Accolade boss who dropped a very good crafting reagents for weapons. The way that tagging worked in that game was whoever did the most damage got the loot, and the people who did the most damage were the ones who had the weapons from the Acolyte. So as long as they're persistent enough, they could effectively lock out anyone else from the server from ever getting a kill. Here comes World of Warcraft though. Although not the first, they were one of the first ones to popularize the instanced format of raids and dungeons. On release, we had the legendary Molten Core and Anixia raids. These were tested internally during the beta, but for 99% of the player base, their first experience would be post-launch. The World of Warcraft Diary by John Stats describes players' first interactions with the Molten Core, and how they were unable to conquer even the first two Molten Giants guarding the entrance, even with developers there trying to walk them through it. They instead chose to wander around like chickens with their heads cut off, and then disconnect mid-pole because their mom got on the phone and their AWOL kicked them off. Or they just sucked. It's one of the charms missing from the re-release, most would agree. And as a result, the rating scene has been rather dull, as players today are much better than they were on release, and that's something you can never recreate. Regardless, the Molten Core and Anixia. I mean, what really needs to be said? This is classic MMO rating at its finest. The Molten Core is a 10 boss instance, and even though 5 of those were just salamander copies of themselves, during the time, the raid was extremely intricate and intimidating. Just the fact that you needed 39 other human players said enough. We're all sitting there on our 4-3 CRT monitors, wondering what would crash first, the game or internet. Even voice comms were rare back then because you had to pay for them. No unlimited free and easy to use Discord servers, creatable with the click of a button. 
Nope, just you, and your probably terribly built character, because he had no idea what was going on, and a thirst for loot. To pay testament to the difficulty of the raids back then, it wasn't until January 30th of 2005 that the one raid boss, Anixia, was killed. And as for the Molten Core, Regnaros fell in April. Quite a contrast to the re-release, where both were cleared by the Guild Apes within the first week. And that's including the grind to 60. What I'm getting at here is that it was a special and magical time. It wasn't just the raids that were great. They were, but the environment surrounding them itself is something that's even more important. To witness the early 2000s during the dawn of MMOs and the birth of the internet culture is something that's extremely unique. Going outside the game for a moment, to be able to not only talk to anyone in another corner of the world, but to team up with them in a dungeon or raid, to now have any piece of information at your fingertips at any time, as well as vast amounts of pornography, was truly a historic moment in human history. Anyways, raids. A unique thing in the genre, and a standard set by Blizzard. Another big aspect of the patch though, were the racials. In the previous episode, the races were being messed with quite a bit, both in looks and in balance. Remember that dwarves could be mages at first, but that was eventually removed, and female trolls looked like this, and it was only in the last patch that we got the models and animations that we all know and love today. Looks aren't everything though. Just like any RPG, each race got their own unique perks. If you're familiar with the racials of the re-release, these will all look pretty much the same to you. They're largely unchanged from 1.1 to 1.12. I won't go over each one here. Something unique to mention though is that this was the patch that undead players got changed from the undead type to humanoid. Before this, they were unique because they couldn't be feared, polymorphed, nor crowd controlled by any effect that didn't work against undead. But on the flip side, they could be hit by the paladin's exorcism or turn undead, so it didn't come without its downsides. Overall though, the racials in this patch were much more substantial. Unlike current, where everything is pretty much made to be even with each other, and with the advent of race and faction changes, there's no real consequence to your choice. In Classic, there are clear winners for PvE or PvP, and with people's lack of knowledge, no one had any clue of what was best for what. Another side effect of today's knowledge with the re-release that by itself is rather minor, but leads to major problems. For example, the Horde in general are seen to be the better PvP faction due to the Orc's resistance to stun, the Undead's fear, charm, and sleepbreaker, and the Torrent's AoE stun and increased health. So because of this, most of the PvPers rush to the Horde side, and as a result, they outnumber the Alliance quite a bit. So, right now in the re-release, the Horde have a problem of longer queue times. As of this video, I think it's 30 to 50 minutes, and getting longer every day. A funny bit of irony that the faction less inclined for PvP is a better faction for people who like PvP because their queue times are instant. Just one of the hundreds of reasons why the re-release will always be different than the original. There are also some changes to experience gains. In Classic, many people mention that to reach 60, you have to grind mobs or dungeons. This is true if you don't have a good knowledge of all of the zones or an add-on leading you around. If you know where to go and utilize both continents, there are more than enough quests to take you from 1 to 60, at least in 1.12. It's just that back then, again, with players' limited knowledge and fewer add-ons, they just didn't know where to go and they had to resort to mob grinding. It was even worse in the pre-release though, because in 1.1, they added a bunch of quests to the higher level zones to even things out a bit. This wasn't the final tally of quests, as you'll see in future episodes, but before this, you really did have to grind to reach the max level, especially taking into consideration that you lost XP on Spirit Res. That's right, even World of Warcraft went down this route at some point, although it wasn't as bad as some others because you still had a choice. They felt that this really didn't mesh well with the beginner-friendly mindset though, so it's on end just in time for release, now replaced with the Red Sickness mechanic. Regardless, XP loss or permanent death are basically ghosts of the past in the MMO genre at this point. There's certainly an audience for them, but it's just rather small. Combining the intense time investment required to build a character with permanent death or substantial regression is just too big a pill for most people to swallow. And throw into the mix the fact that the game is online, 
where one disconnect can mean months of progress lost, results in a very niche audience of people willing to invest time into it. Speaking of punishing players for dying though, they didn't get off scot-free in this one, because it was this patch is when they added durability damage on death. There has to be at least some punishment on dying, and this is something that's remained within the game even to this day. And another big balance change is the fact that you can no longer swap armor in combat, which is huge. Can you imagine how the game would have been like if you could switch gear in combat? Uh oh, this mage is casting Frostbolt. Quick, hit your macro to switch. Okay, back to DPS gear. It would have been a mess, and the entire PvP meta would have changed. And another balance change is that she can no longer resurrect in combat. I think I mentioned this in the last part, but it's rather funny to think about. Like, do I heal the alive people, or do you think I can get away with a 10 second res here? It reminds me back in the day of being the combat reser in raiding. Back in early raiding, you only got in combat once you attacked something, so raids usually assigned one or two players to stay out of combat and try to snipe some reses. Sort of like infinite battle reses. I was my guild's combat reser when I hit 60 on my first character, my paladin. An important job, typically given to the most useless healers. Except for me, I was amazing, I assure you. In the same patch though, the druids got their rebirth spell, which was usable in combat still. So they sort of retained the ability to res in combat while everyone else lost theirs, but the only downside is they didn't get a normal resurrect. Usually, when building a dungeon group, if you have a druid healer, you have to account for that and bring someone who can actually res, such as a DPS paladin, a shaman, or whatever. Here we also have the spear type has been moved to polearm. Back then, they had both spears and polearms as separate weapon types. They thought it a bit too redundant though, so they just combined the two. That's why many polearms in the game specifically have spear in their name. Before this patch, if you were the highest bidder on an item in the auction house, it would display it publicly for everyone. I imagine that before this, people were getting harassed if they got into a bidding war with someone. If you watched my memory series, you know about the time I got into a bid war with someone over a blue polearm, the gargoyle's bite, and when I eventually won it, he stocked the mailbox and waited until he saw someone equip it. He did spot me, and started yelling at me for outbidding him on it. Hey, it's a hunter weapon, okay? So, even with them censoring, this stuff still happened. I can only imagine how bad it was before this change though. And it was this patch where Torrens also got their coda mounts. If you saw the previous episodes, you know that they had the planes running ability where they just sort of galloped everywhere. I won't go over that again, but I just wanted to mention that this is when they removed it and gave them kodos. And here's an interesting change. Summons now required confirmation from the summonee before they go through. I imagine that you could get pretty trolly with people. Like, oh nice, there's rich thorium. Let me just go ahead. Son of a bee. But it gets even better with this next one. You can no longer summon ghosts. Tell me, what's worse in Classic where if you die, you have to ghost run back for 10 minutes? Getting summoned without consent to the other side of the world. Gee, thanks a lot. And onto the class balance, this patch was probably the biggest to date. Quite a busy time I'm sure for Kevin Jordan, the class designer for Blizzard at the time. There are pages and pages of this stuff, but as always, I'll pick out the highlights. First up, we have the Paladin and Hunter talents, finished just in time for release. These would be quite different. The Hunter Survival Tree was initially called Outdoorsmanship, and it had that awful rent talent as their final skill. Everything else was more suited for melee combat though, as you could see. The birth of every weapon being a Hunter weapon. Thanks a lot, Kevin. <laughs> Spirit Bond used to be the final Beast Mastery talent, and it gave you health on Pet Head. A pretty diesel amount as well, considering that the fastest pets were 1.0 speed, and you also have that frenzy talent. And as for paladins, you'll notice that everything is sort of shuffled around as well. The 1.1 talents in general for each class are wildly different than 1.12. The thing that they share is that overall they're just weaker. I mentioned earlier that the raids in the re-release are rather trivial so far, and this is one of the reasons. People didn't first step foot into the Molten Core with 1.12 talents or class balance. 
is not the most major reason as to why the raids are easier. I think it comes more from our increased familiarity and skill with the genre as a whole, but still a contributing factor. Since we mentioned Paladins though, they got a major overhaul this patch. Before this, they had instant damage spells such as Crusader Strike, but that was replaced with the Seal and Judge system this patch. I believe reason being is that they wanted the Paladin to be more of a reactionary playstyle. Their main damage moved on to auto-attacking so they can quickly throw out one of their many support spells to allies in need. It was definitely different and a lot of people complain, but it's unique and it's that uniqueness is what makes Classic special I think. It's very RPG-esque in a good way where not everything has to be the same as each other. So those are the most major things in patch 1.1. It's a doozy, that's for sure. It's a lot to take in. We'll see what the players thought of it though, like we did with the last one. Now that the beta is officially over, what did the subscribers think of the release of what was going to be the most revolutionary MMO in gaming history? Yeah, about as expected. Here you can see the result of Blizzard being unprepared for the huge amount of people playing the game. I thought that these two threads have a rather comedic spacing between them. Remember, female characters get a hidden passive. Horny nerds have a 20% chance to give you free stuff in exchange for attention. And here's a real interesting one. Again, the whole idea of instanced raids and lockouts was such a new thing at the time that players didn't know what to make of it. Today, you may laugh at this post. Imagine being able to clear the Molten Core infinitely and gearing out an entire raid within a week. But it just goes to show what the standard was back then. And today, lockouts are a staple of any MMO to control the raid at which players progress their characters. But anyways, as you could see, everybody's just adoring their time in Azeroth. Only a few complaints to sue here and there, nothing too crazy. The game is going just swimmingly, everybody just started their adventure to 60, there's no YouTube, no guides, it's just you, the manual, and the game, and your dial-up internet, as long as no one... Ah, crap. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.